many of you have a bucket list? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All those things you want to do before you die. I tell you, people frequently tell me things that are on their bucket list. Uh, and usually it's something like they want to see the Grand Canyon or they want to go to Europe or they, they want to ride in a hot air balloon or something like that. Um, but today we read about a man, when George read the scripture to us, he had one item on his bucket list, and that was to see the Messiah. Now just imagine that the most important thing in his life was seeing the Messiah. How about us? What is the most important thing in our lives, the one thing that we would then be ready to die if that happened? And does that one thing have to do with our relationship with God? I mean, if we really thought about it, what could possibly be more important? Now, I have to tell you, I cannot read the story of Simeon and Anna without remembering the day, or actually the day after Vicky was born. Uh, it'd been a really hard year for my family. My dad had been dying of, of uh, cancer, and he had died in April, and I delivered Vicky in August. And... Um, all my friends and family were really worried when I got pregnant because, you know, I was taking care of two preschoolers and I was taking care of my mom and dad and life was stressful. I remember when the doctor told me at four months I had not gained a pound and I needed to gain weight, um, which I did that month. But anyway, um, we had an incredibly supportive church family and they were with us every step of the way through my pregnancy, through my dad's illness and death. And so they were really concerned about me when I got pregnant. And so when Vicky was born, everybody was so excited that she was healthy and that I was healthy and new life was beginning. And I named her for my dad and it was just a real celebration. Well, she was born late on a Saturday night and the next day, as soon as worship was over, my hospital room was packed with people from church. I mean, at least 15 people at a time in a hospital room is very crowded. And finally, I was just dying, dying, dying to go to the bathroom. And I said, excuse me, I need to use the ladies' room. And everybody said, okay, you know, and they just all stayed there, and, you know. And I, so I got up in my little whatever and go into the restroom, and I'm thinking they're all hearing every single thing I'm doing, you know. You know how it is in the hospital, and I'm thinking, ah! Anyway, when I opened the door to come back out, there was a woman from my church who was standing there, the mom of a very dear friend, and she was holding my precious Vicky. Now, this woman had been in and out of psychiatric institutions throughout her lifetime, and I had heard countless stories of her irrational behavior, and I observed some of that behavior, and she was not even allowed to be alone with her grandchildren, her daughter's children, um, and there she was holding my hours-old baby, and I walked out, and my heart just went... <gasps> But it was all good. She was holding Vicky very gently and saying all those wonderful things you say to a newborn. And it was really beautiful. But for a moment, for that moment, my heart just stopped. And I have to wonder if that's what Mary felt that day. Here she is going to the temple for one of those high holy moments. Some ways, just like Daniel and Lily brought their baby today to be baptized. It was 40 days. Um, and in those days, there were some rituals that were required by the law. First, there was a circumcision at eight days. And then there were two more requirements at 40 days. One was a presentation of the baby. In essence, giving the child back to God, acknowledging that the child is God's and saying, this is your child. <clears throat> and that is my precious grandson knocking. I think he wants to come inside. Um, and then there was also the purification rites of Mary, so she'd be ritually clean. So there were always lots of people at the temple, so it wasn't like everybody stopped for this presentation like we did here today. There was lots of activity, people going and coming. Um, and, you know, Mary and Joseph were from the town of Nazareth, which is about 68 to 70 miles away, so they wouldn't have been known at the temple or in the temple courts. People wouldn't have seen them walk in and say, oh, that's Mary and Joseph. They were just another young couple going about the rituals required by law. And as they walk into the temple courts, this old man who is a complete stranger, someone they had never seen before in their lives, comes up and takes their child in their arms. What would you do? Yeah. Now, Mary had had some pretty big surprises over the past year, and her, her heart had probably done a few little flips. 
But you know, when this old man she had never seen before takes her precious baby in her arms, don't you know that her heart like kind of went... <laughs> then he said some really strange words. God, let your servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. This old man with old eyes probably had cataracts, yet his eyes recognized Christ and he was now ready to leave this earthly life. The most important thing he had dreamed about his entire life had come to fruition. His life was complete. But that's not all he said. Then he tells the young parents how hard it's going to be. Now don't you love that? You have a baby, you're going to the baptism, then everybody comes up and says, now let me tell you. It's going to be really bad for your child. Kind of ruins the holy moment, doesn't it? Um, he tells the parents how Jesus would expose those who wanted to get close to God and how those who didn't want to be close to God would want to get rid of him. He warned Mary of the pain to come and that a sword would pierce her soul. Now remember just last week we heard how Mary pondered all these things in her heart. Well, can you imagine the pondering that was going on now? You know, one of my favorite Christmas songs is Mary, Did You Know? And we heard it on Christmas Eve. We'll hear it a little later today. But it asks that question, Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did she get it? As he said those words, did she have any clue? But before they could even catch their breath, they heard another person, a woman named Anna, talking out loud about their child and praising God for this precious baby and speaking about him to all who were looking for the redemption of Israel. Now, you know, they're probably sitting there, and here's this old man has her baby, and then this old woman who never leaves the temple comes up. They probably thought she was crazy, and she starts ranting. Would you have believed what she had said? Probably not. Now, Mary and Joseph had heard these things foretold in Scripture, and they'd had a visitation from an angel, and there were all those visitors at the birth, and here there were two more folks they'd never heard of saying things that were hard to comprehend. And, you know, I think it's hard for us to realize how shocking it had to be for Mary and Joseph because we've heard the story our whole life. And, and we think, well, of course they would have recognized this baby as a Messiah because we were brought up with the idea that this was the Son of God. But that was shocking for the people because in Israel's day, they didn't expect a baby They expected the Messiah to come in clouds of glory, to see the heavens torn open and the Son of Man descending with armies of angels. And they expected the Messiah to sit on a throne and rule the world with a a mighty fist. And they were looking for the clouds of glory of the Messiah. Not a baby. And even though some shepherds had come to the birth and believed he was the Messiah, who would believe a shepherd? So to have these two people recognize that Jesus was the Messiah was really out there. It was beyond anyone's expectations. And you have to wonder, how did Simeon know? How did Anna know? They hadn't seen any miracles. The angels hadn't come to them. They hadn't heard the angels singing glory to God in the highest. They both saw this infant and immediately knew he was the one. Maybe Simeon and Anna were able to recognize him because they were doing the kind of scene that involves expecting to see. They were being open, willing, and eager to experience life through the eyes of faith. Quite honestly, most of us aren't like that. You know, Luke's gospel is full of people who come so close to Jesus and whom Jesus comes so close to, and yet they fail to see him for who he is. And Jesus spoke about those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, but But seeing they don't see and hearing they don't hear. Even his own disciples walking along the road to Emmaus didn't recognize him. As he interpreted the scriptures to them, they don't know him until the breaking of the bread and their eyes are opened. You see, in Luke's gospel, it seems as if seeing always involves being open, being willing and eager to experience life through the eyes of faith. It's as if real seeing doesn't take place with the eyes but with the heart and the mind. Real seeing happens when we let go of our expectations, when we're open to things we hadn't even considered. So what was it that enabled Simeon and Anna? And are there some things that we might do 
to help us recognize the Messiah's presence in our midst. You know, I think there's so many times we get so excited because we believe God is calling us to do something and we believe God has promised something and then it doesn't happen today and it doesn't happen tomorrow and then we get frustrated and we get discouraged and we rail at God. Why isn't this happening? And it's hard for us to understand God's timing. Well, Simeon and Anna had been waiting for years and yet they didn't get discouraged. We're told that they were righteous and devout. They went to, were at the temple regularly. In fact, Anna was there day and night. So they weren't just waiting and doing nothing. They were actively waiting. Henry Nouwen says that actively waiting means being fully present to the moment, confident that what is happening where you are, that there's something happening where you are and you want to experience it. And that one says that active waiting is essential for the spiritual life. So Simeon, Simeon and Anna were actively waiting, which meant they continued to come to the temple day in and day out. They continued to pray, to study the scriptures, to worship, to offer sacrifices, to bring their first fruits, to go through the rituals. They continued to look expectantly, even though it seemed as if nothing was happening. And we need to do that too. We need to keep doing all those things that place us in a position that we are closer to Christ. We need to study and pray and worship and give of ourselves. We need to attend some type of study or class regularly. We need to worship with our church family consistently. We need to pray more often than just before meals and as we're going to sleep at night. We need to give more than what is just left over but to give our first fruits, trusting God will take care of the rest. We need to practice all the spiritual disciplines, even when sometimes they seem stale, because all those things help us become more aware of the presence of Christ. Now, the next thing Simeon and Anna did was they were open to God moving in unexpected ways. You know, so many times we are so confident that we know exactly what God's going to do. God is going to do this this way and the way I think it, and we miss what God is doing altogether because God doesn't fit into a box. You know, the entire nation of Israel thought the Messiah was coming only for Israel. But Simeon said the Savior would be a light even to the Gentiles. Simeon got the big picture. He knew it wasn't just about him and his people. And that was way outside the box. Can we let go of our preconceived ideas and allow God to show us the bigger picture? And third, we need to be open to what the Spirit calls us to do. Simeon felt a nudge that day to go to the temple. And he went. He didn't know why. He just went. And then because he was open, because he had been spending time in prayer and study, he recognized the Messiah. You know, a few, few days we begin a new year. And it's a time for new beginnings and new commitments. And, and, you know, we talk so much about New Year's resolutions and they seem to always have to do with diet and exercise and cleaning our house and our work ethics, our habits. But what about our spiritual disciplines? Can we do the things that will open us to the unexpected and amazing ways that God is moving in our midst. Can we let go of the idea that we know exactly what God's going to do? As we begin 2015, I challenge you to do the things that will place yourself in a position to hear God speak. Commit to study, worship, prayer, service, and giving. Practice the spiritual disciplines. Let go of preconceived ideas or anger or frustration at things that aren't happening that you want because maybe God has something even better and more exciting in store for you. May our prayer this be, year be, open the eyes of my heart because I want to see you. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, it is so hard for us to be open to you because we seem to think we know it all and we want everything to go according to our plan and, and we get frustrated because we don't feel close to you but we don't take time to 
to study and pray and worship and do all those things that will bring us close to you. So God, creating us a hunger for those things. Help us to let go of our preconceived ideas. Lord, help us to be open to the exciting things you're going to do. Open the eyes of our heart, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.